My name is Jared Orsi, and I am a member of the Board of Directors of the Theologian in Residence Program, and I'm very pleased to welcome you tonight to the final event in our speaker series this year. Janine Hill Fletcher from Fordham University will be speaking to us about forming religious identity in a cosmopolitan world, among other things. Before we do that, I would like to make a personal commercial announcement while I have a captive audience, and that is that many of you know that I have been um, working on a biography of Zebulon Pike for several years. He's the fellow for whom Pike's Peak is named, and he was a military explorer who came to, the United, to Colorado in 1806 and 1807. And it is finally done. Uh, and I would like to invite any and all of you to join me and my family and my colleagues and friends this Saturday at Old Firehouse Books in Old Town for a party to celebrate the book. And that brings some treats and snacks and there will be kind of a rolling slideshow of Pike's um, time in Colorado, and I'll sign books, and we'll have treats. And um, so if, uh, if the history of Colorado and exploration of Zebulon Pike interests you at all, please uh, come join us for that. That is Saturday at, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. It's kind of an open house, so you can drop in and take some cookies and move along with your shopping in Old Town or whatever you want to do. So 2 to 4 p.m. Saturday at Old Firehouse Books. And um, now I'll turn it over to Joachim Vienz, who will introduce tonight's speaker. I just had four or five pages. <laughs> well, the past two weeks, I've read two books with great delight. I just could not put down a Citizen Explorer about Zebulon Pike. <laughs> it's a really great story. Absolutely wonderful. There's a lot more to the United States than just what was east of the other days. And this book will tell you all about that. Great story. Uh, I also read in the past two weeks Janine's latest book with equal delight and pleasure. So a lot of good reading there for you. Uh, I'd just like to take a couple of words to situate tonight's speaker. Um, our theme this year, we had several themes, but the major one was evolution. The story of evolution from the Big Bang down through human life and human cultures and human religions. And it seems as though that story is functioning for many people like a new creation story. And our premise for this year's series was that fact deserves critical theological reflection. So we did the best we could to sort of tell that story um, with the help of Ken Wilber, who's a philosopher of religion, with the help of Robert Bella, who's a sociologist of religion, and with the help of Richard Rohr, who's a spiritual master who's much loved because I think he's speaking to our situation today in very helpful ways. Um, and that was also something that Jim Reed got us started on, I think it was a year ago in October, that Jim Reed gave, and I gave a talk on uh, ever-widening circles of human experience and religious experience. Uh, so in this series, we moved from Catholic to ecumenical. The last talk I gave was on a trans-denominational ecclesiology, which was meant to be an ecumenical move. And then uh, Mike McGoldrick wasn't able to do it, but he is still due to give a talk on Christianity and Hinduism, I think, if I got that right. Uh, and then uh, our speaker tonight is very much involved in uh, interfaith and interhuman dialogue. So um, tonight's speaker caught our attention because she's so skilled in so many of the themes uh, that we've been talking about. I first uh, read her article in Theological Studies, a very erudite magazine, my favorite magazine, Catholic Theological Studies, and she wrote an article in there about hybridity and identity. 
And she's quoted in two of my favorite theologians, uh, Roger Haight and Elizabeth Johnson, and they both quote the same line at very important parts of their book, that she, her suggestion, that if we would start out thinking about identity, if we'd start out with what we have in common, instead of starting out with what divides us, it would be a much more ecumenical situation. It reminds me, we have a very conservative person who writes in the uh, Denver Catholic Register. His name is George Weigel. And the title of his weekly column is The Catholic Difference. <laughs> so anyway. Janine, I think, brings three different perspectives to what we've been talking about. Three new perspectives. Uh, she has specialized with wonderful mentors, Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza, one of them, in feminist theology. And she has really read it, and I've read a lot of those people, not as many she has. But she put it together in a way that really moved me forward immensely on what feminist theology is. She has spent a lot of time doing research uh, into interfaith women's groups and making the point that the stories that women tell in interfaith groups are really become sources for theological reflection. And as a feminist, she'd like to tell us what would happen to this male theology that we all grew up on if we were open to the experience of women as a theological source. And um, she's also interested, she doesn't just talk about other religious women, but she talks about feminists who aren't religiously affiliated. So she's interested in an interhuman dialogue as well as an inter ecumenical or interfaith. She's also interested in what she calls cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitan Catholicism, perhaps. I think her credentials are in her published work. Uh, I really enjoyed her many articles and her book. Uh, but uh, you could just mention on the site, she's written numerous, maybe dozens of articles and certainly dozens of book reviews. And uh, she just happens to uh, have done her graduate work and her doctoral work at Harvard Divinity School. That's a, I guess that's a fairly decent one. <laughs> I can claim the angelic from a bunch of Dominican men, but anyway. <laughs> it's a pleasure to introduce to you a really delightful person and scholar. And her title is Undoing. I said this, we were going to do a critical reflection on evolution. It's called Undoing Re Evolution. Constructing Religious Identity in a Cosmopolitan Joachim, um, and also thank the members of the TIR board, and then thank all of you. I've spent the last 24 hours getting to know you in a variety of ways, um, and it makes my work so much more meaningful to have a sense of conversation partners, and the wonderful conversation partners that you've been to me, and that I hope we will continue um, throughout this evening, and also the wonderful conversation partner that Joachim has been throughout the year. Um, and so I'll offer some things. My plan for this evening is uh, to, to give you my, if I say argument, you're going to think I'm argumentative, but to give you my ideas in three movements, let's call it that. Um, to give you my ideas in three movements and in between each of them, just to have a little, it can be Q&A if there are questions of clarification, but mostly just a, you know, does this sound reasonable? Right? Do, you, do you see where I'm going and, and do you have experiences that would, um, that would say, yeah, that's a, a one way of thinking about it. Um, uh, so I'll do the first two of those movements with a little conversation in, in between. We'll take a little break and then we'll do the last movement and then a longer section of just kind of conversation, discussion, Q&A, that sort of thing. All right? um, I was invited here today, I think, because I work as a Catholic theologian. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, but I'm also a practitioner of Hindu-inspired yoga at a suburban New Jersey studio. So I want to meet. I want you to meet me on my mat for just a minute, <laughs> sitting comfortably, breathing easily, 
your eyes perhaps closed. Notice how your natural posture holds you. Do you lean forward, anticipating the future? Do you rest back, holding on to the past? Or are you balanced and centered in the present? So you can open your eyes if you close them. Like so many moments on the mat, this was an aha moment for me. Indeed, I lean forward. I anticipate the next article, the next research project, the next family event, sometimes with anxiety of all the things there is to do with our lives, but sometimes with excitement at all the possibilities of what we can do with our lives. As I'll invite you to see, a major influence on my theology, the great 20th century German theologian Karl Rahner, suits me well because he theologizes about our inherent abilities as human persons to lean forward, to grow, or, would, or as he would say, to transcend. Because of what has become my own posture of leaning forward, I've enjoyed checking in with Joe Kim throughout this year and hearing from him about the unfolding of this series. Indeed, I think evolution is a new story that suits us moderns and is easily woven into Christian theology. But sitting on my mat, I realized that what has become an inherent posture of leaning forward is at the expense sometimes of being balanced and centered in the present moment. So yoga for me is a corrective to this tendency of what my teachers call my, yoke, my monkey mind, right, to always be at work seeing what's next. But my yoga practice is invitation out of the past, not yet into the future, centered in today, also may not be sufficient for us theologically. For the more work I've done with the Dorothy Day Center for Service and Justice at my university, the more I've come to recognize that the social sins of our past continue to form the fabric of our present. If we're not attentive to the way the past continues to haunt our present, we may be blind to the inadequacies of our moment in the evolutionary story. When we can see material disparities in our human family, it becomes necessary to ask whether elements of our evolution have been at the expense of our others, racially, culturally, religiously. In order to move ahead together, we must revisit our past and rethink our future. And so if you've seen the announcement for this evening, I'm, in, I'm interested in revisiting our past and possibly undoing evolution as a way of moving forward toward a cosmopolitan religious identity. But let me begin with Karl Rahner. So Karl Rahner uh, was a Catholic theologian, lived in the 20th century, lived from 1904 to 1984, and he's a very modern theologian, writing volumes of work, especially in the last half of the 20th century. His theology learned deeply from advances in science and contemporary thought on evolution. In fact, his overarching framework was invested in an, in an evolutionary view, so that many of his essays place classical theological <laughs> concepts within an evolutionary framework. So this is kind of taking up uh, the, the conversation about evolution and introducing Rahner as one way of, that theologians have, have woven their work into a, an evolutionary framework. For Rahner, the story of evolution fit perfectly with his portrait of the human being in relation to God. In Rahner's theological view, God created the world in its component parts of both matter and spirit. While matter is the stuff of ourselves and of our world, both self and world are also irreducibly plural, insofar as they are matter, both, both world and self, are matter infused with spirit. The intimate joining of matter and spirit sees their relationship tend toward the <coughs> transcendence of matter into spirit. Or, as Rahner writes, and I quote him, matter develops out of its inner being in the direction of spirit, end quote. The lower order of nature of matter is enlivened by the stirrings of spirit. And this is just as true for the world and for history in a broad evolutionary sweep as it is for the individual, as both unfold in newness. For Rahner, evolution is not simply a scientific project describing the non-human world, it's a story wherein humanity is precisely the point of the evolutionary process. Rahner conceived that just as nature evolves towards the emergence of self-reflective humankind, the human person is capable of the same growth, the same becoming more, of matter into spirit. <coughs> 
The human person is fundamentally characterized as that reality which has the power of becoming more. The term he used for this when he was talking about humanity was self-transcendence, by which he meant the human person always growing beyond the present self in knowledge, through free choices, and in love. Self-transcendence is, in a way, the evolutionary process of the cosmos taking place in everyday human lives. Rahner saw the most basic human experiences, the ability to know, to love, and to make free choices, as indicating an experience of the God who created the world and humanity, such that both were always able to evolve. Each and every time the human person goes beyond him or herself in growth or love, or pursues a life path not bound by the gains of a material world, or recognizes the incomprehensible in the process of learning, that individual extends beyond the limits of what he or she presently is and creates something new. As the individual oversteps the boundaries which define the present self, he or she has the experience of reaching into that which is not the self and encountering the boundless range of possibilities contained in the ever-receding horizon of transcendence. The human person is thus opened to the absolute fullness of being. When the individual realizes that the self's extension is limitless and that the ultimate term toward which we reach can never be grasped or understood, she or he has the opportunity to recognize the infinite mystery that Rahner names God. Reflecting on the, on the connection between the inexhaustibility of human growth and that which makes this endless growth possible, Rahner names God as, quote, precisely that mystery of the incomprehensible, the inexpressible, toward which at every moment of my life I am always tending, end quote. God exists for Rahner as the source and sustenance of human growth and transcendence. Whether humans recognize it or not, whether they name it or not, and importantly, whether they are Christian or not. In the very structure of human knowing, willing, and loving, God is present to all persons who remain open to the grace-filled movement into ever greater becoming. So this is Rahner. I know when I go off script, it, and, then I, and then I eat up time. Um, but, but this is Rahner, right? And this is my horizon for Rahner. His view of evolution is that, of course, the cosmos is always evolving. Right? God has created the world such as both matter and spirit. So the cosmos itself is infused with spirit toward ever greater becoming. The human person, in Rahner's evolutionary view, right, the cosmos emerges, emerges, emerges toward the emergence of self-reflective humanity. Right? And self-reflective humanity is the point of evolution and the point of creation for Rahner. Right? Rahner then goes on to say that human persons participate in that growth. Right? And, and asks his audience, could you ever exhaust the possibilities for what you might learn something new? Can you ever exhaust the possibilities for making free choices or for opening yourself up in love in a new way? And he says, every time we do that, we create something new with ourselves. And because we can experience this always creating something new with ourselves as a limitless horizon, right? he names God as the source of that growth, stirring our spirit, having created us that way, and as the horizon of our transcendence, calling us to ever greater growth. The human person in an evolutionary framework, and God as the source of that evolutionary framework. So far, so far so good with Rahner? Okay, so good. The human person is constituted by unlimited openness to the possibilities that lie before him or her. We look out on an unlimited horizon of transcendence. We are unlimited in the possibilities of our growth. Every time we engage these fundamental human acts of new knowledge, free choices, and the expansion of our love, we are sustained by the infinite source of growth, which Rahner names God. Each and every time we engage in these fundamental human acts, we move beyond our former self, we become something new, we evolve. Our own human evolution and the evolution of the cosmos is a call from God, in Rahner's way of thinking. So for Rahner, there was never a disconnect between evolutionary thinking and Catholic theology. They were both pointing to the same reality. Rahner's view of the human person is captivating, and I've been captivated by it. This sense that, yes, I can always find these opportunities for growth. This sense that we are constituted by our fundamental abilities to grow, to become who we want to become, 
to make free choices, to open ourselves to new ideas and knowledge. We are, in Rahner's view, fundamentally as human beings, whole in our individuality before the God who calls us as the infinite horizon of our possibilities for becoming. The story is captivating, and it's one I embraced until I became a mother. <laughs> I was no longer free to become who I wanted to become. I was quite constrained by this little mother. I no longer had the opportunity or access to gain new knowledge. Was I going to bring my son into the library with me exactly? The limits of my patience, dare I say my love, were tested again and again. I'm not even sure I was really an individual anymore, certainly not in quite the same way. As a theologian and a mother, I needed to take Rahner to task, to make an intervention in a theological narrative that seemed to suggest that we evolve as human beings solely by the grace of God, as individuals by God's grace and our gumption. Okay, I don't even know if gumption is a word, but it just sounded so nice. Right? The sense that what it is to be human for Rahner is to be called by God and to find it within ourselves to answer that call, right? Um, but that he frames it as, as very individual. I needed to make this intervention because I began to see more clearly the feminist theological contribution to thinking about ourselves as human beings where feminist theologians insisted we're not fundamentally isolated individuals, but we're situated inescapably in networks of relationships. Feminist insight questioned whether the individualized person ought to have priority in our thinking theologically about who we are as human beings. Instead, feminist theorists and feminist theologians encourage us to ask whether sociality and intersubjectivity of relationship aren't more fundamental. From a feminist perspective, the human condition isn't first that of solitude, from which one then enters community. Rather, sociality is primary in our human experience. Luce Rigore conceives the human person as always one constituted by the persons one encounters. She writes, she herself enters into a ceaseless exchange of herself with the other without any possibility of identifying either." End quote. Privileging relationality as the fundamental human condition, Irigaray puts forth an anthropology that cannot be reduced to the individual. Rather, the self is constituted by relationships, where the boundary between self and other is permeable. Catherine Keller extends this understanding from a process theological perspective, <coughs> describing our radical relatedness in this way. She writes, I cannot exist without in some sense taking part in you, in the child I once was, in the breeze stirring the down on my arm, in the child starving far away, in the flashing round of the spiral nebula. I am not a separate and enduring substance, but an event in which the universe composes itself. The subject does not precede its own experiences, but arises from its relations." End quote. I am an event, constituted by the multiple relationships that form me. I am an event constituted by others. Just as a child is dependent on his or her caregiver, my human becoming is dependent on the whole network of people who have made me who I am, and my human becoming is indebted to countless others who make me who I am. With Catherine Keller and others speaking forth our basic human condition as relationality, not individuality, I began to think that the metaphor of motherhood was perhaps one way of construing our humanity and its necessary dependence upon and care for others. What I was thinking here is that perhaps that sense of being constrained in my choices was not because I was sync, so I was out of sync with our freedom as human beings but rather that the conception of ourselves as ultimately free to do as we choose was out of sync with reality. Just as I was now responsible for the well-being of another, this new child, perhaps we all share the responsibility for the well-being of one another, or perhaps we should. While the subject position of mother has helped me see clearly my inescapable relationality to my children, to their father, to their grandparents, my reliance on relationships to their caregivers and their teachers, while this new subject position of motherhood helped me to experience relationality viscerally, it helped me to ask the question whether all our lives aren't intimately tied up in relationship and responsibility to countless others. 
I don't stand on the horizon of infinite transcendence all by myself and grow alone. I only grow and transcend and evolve in intimate relationships of dependence, vulnerability, reliance, and care with countless others. My family of origin, my current family, my extended family, but also my colleagues and my community, my students, and my audience. The circles of concern we widen are not simply because we, as individuals, have evolved to have a generosity of heart, but rather because we are indebted to all those others who make our lives possible and ourselves who they are. The primary reality of the human condition that the experience of motherhood illumines is that we are, all of us, embedded in relationality. We enter this world dependent upon those who have preceded us, and we walk through this world in complex networks of care, dependence, and fragile solidarity. In pursuing a way of framing our humanity through the lens of motherhood, a multi-relational and multi-generational point of view emerges. Our sacred lives as human beings before God are not focused on ourselves alone, but extend out to those who have nurtured us and those we nurture. While the symbolism may be rooted in the subject positions gendered female, the experience of motherhood, the experience it describes, that experience of relationality, is not bound by gender or biology. The actions and relations engaged as mother provide content that can be applied to human beings regardless of biology and gender. While articulated in symbolic language rooted in women's experience, motherhood is more widely applicable by invitation to humanity at large. So with this idea of motherhood as a metaphor for our human condition of relationality, of dependence, of vulnerability, of care, um, it is in a sense, um, I don't know if corrective is quite the, quite the right word, but it adds to Rahner's notion, right? That if we're going to vision ourselves as evolving, Right? What does it mean that we don't do that as individuals, but that we do that from out of a, a network of relationship, right? that we are indebted to those who have helped us and we are um, responsible right, to the evolution of, of others as well. Um, so those are my first two movements. Doing okay on time. Those are my first two movements. And the first, the first two movements are this. We have this, way of we have this horizon of evolutionary thinking. Um, that I see rooted in Rahner's thought, or I, I have kind of come to that story of evolution through Rahner's thought. Um, and I wonder if that matches with some of the things that you think or that you've talked about in terms of evolution as a new story. Um, but then also I have this kind of second movement that says that the story of evolution that I've inherited from Rahner is individualized and I want to see a more relational story. Um, and so I wondered whether there were other um, uh, other strands of thought that you've already encountered in your thinking right, that moves to the um, relational rather than just the individual. Um, so maybe, so, so those are my questions for you, but maybe you have questions of clarification at this point. Rahner makes, Rahner makes, um, Rahner offers a, an, a story of evolution. Is that, the, is that the new story? Is that part of the story that, that you've been thinking with in terms of the evolutionary story? Yeah. Jeanine, I just kind of wonder if you'd make a distinction between um, Cobb and Whitehead in process and what Rodner does with this evolutionary idea. I was just kind of more exposed to the other than to Rodner. So That's it was right. fascinating to hear it. Oh, it sounds like God is much more a part of this. This is not your usual theological conversation. <laughs> I've been, I've been, uh, there have been so many different sets of insights that have come to me in the last 24 hours from people coming from so many different wonderful places. Uh, and this is a, a particular theological uh, uh, trajectory here. So have you done process theology as a group? Okay, so process theology and process thought um, does more of conceptualizing ourselves and the nature of human existence as this always moving um, in process interrelated reality right whereas I think Rahner is coming out of a more um, I don't I know that process theology is a, a movement within modern thought but I think he's kind of a more, more like a classic modernist that maybe has been really influenced by not quite the process way of thinking, but more um, what, what scholars would describe as kind of this 
uh, philosophical and theological turn to the subject. That is, thinking about who we are as human beings, thinking about who we are as human beings as the producers of knowledge, thinking about who we are as human beings and the processes of knowledge, tends, tends to really focus in on the, the human person um, and, and tends not to really um, broaden out to the scope that, that Cobb uh, and then Catherine Keller right, in this more process-oriented framework. Um, so the, the philosophical trajectory that, that Rahner comes out of really is interested in what can the human person do in terms, of, in terms of our thinking, in terms of our knowledge, in terms of our actions, in terms of our will, um, and really privileges the, the, the human person right, and, and tends in the way that certain um, trajectories of modern science, maybe not contemporary science, but tra certain trajectories of modern science really kind of said, well, we as human beings can figure everything else out and didn't really see the embeddedness. So Rahner and process thought are two different frameworks. Um, and in a sense, I think that the feminist theological trajectory um, comes more out of the sensibilities of the process way of thinking, even if, even if not all feminist theologians are process thinkers. Does that both answer that question and, <laughs> and answer it in a way that people have a sense of these being, they're different philosophical trajectories, different, different ways of approaching the questions, and then they produce different theologies as a result. Follow on. Does it, does it look like in Rahner's theology that God is more of an active draw than in a process thought? Rahner does, Rahner does a, a couple of things. Rahner is, uh, he's, a, he's a Catholic theologian and he's trying to follow, to some extent, he's, he's not trying to break too much new ground um, and wanting to, to think about God as, as creator, right? And so the infinite horizon is this vision of God as creator who calls creation forward. But he also, so if you, wanted to, if you wanted to move him in a closer affinity with the process theologians in terms of, of where God's energy is at work, um, he takes the idea of incarnation seriously. And he takes the idea of, Rahner takes the idea of incarnation seriously, not just for Jesus, but as a reflection of what it means to be human. Right? And so he, he says that we can learn from the doctrine of incarnation or you know, what, what the doctrine of incarnation is articulating is, and this is his words, deep in our own nature God dwells. He says that's what, the, that's what incarnation is affirming, right? And it's not just true of Jesus, it's true of all of humanity and it's in, in, it's in relation to this um, evolutionary framework, right? That God created the world so that Right? We could have self-reflective human beings who are aware of this creator God. Um, and so God both calls forth the human person and dwells within, and is, is that which propels that evolutionary process. There were, there were, and I'm going to keep an eye on time, because I'm a theologian, and I could just keep going. <laughs> yeah? It strikes me that... Uh... Also use you could also use uh, the doing of evolution. Say that again. You could instead of an undoing of evolution, you could say, in terms of much of what you talked about, you could even use the word doing evolution. Doing evolution, being right. part of evolution. Part now, of it. now, do you know Bob? Because Bob's got the first movement as clear as clear can be. Right? Because Rahner is a part of the doing of evolution. And, the, and the, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking about the critical edge that's about to come around the corner. Um, because, because, I wonder if I can go right into it here. Yeah, I'm going to go right into it here. Not, is that all right with everybody? Right? Because Bob's, you've got it right on. Right? Rahner's got this sense, this incredibly wonderful and beautiful and, t and very, very optimistic sense right, about the, the potential and the possibilities of human beings in their, in their being energized by this process and their doing of evolution, right? Absolutely, that's Rahner's, that's Rahner's vision, right? Um, but what I want to do and what I'm going to do right now in the next move and then, and then we can keep talking about it what I want to do uh, in thinking with Rahner and thinking with the, the data of human experience is ask the question, for whom does this story work? 
right? For whom does this reflect? Right? In the same way that I kind of said, okay, I'm, I'm doing the evolutionary process and I'm, and I'm taken by Rahner, and then I realize all the constraints that I have as a mother, right? And, and the ways that the story doesn't work as well given my situation. Um, we'll see if that comes back on, because I have a great picture that's coming up. Okay. Um, and so the, so the next move is, right, does this story work as well Right, across the board for all of us within the human family as Rahner wants it to. Right? So Rahner wants us to be thinking about our own participation in and our own doing of evolution. And now we'll see where the undoing goes. Okay. So even my inclusion, oh, uh, I was supposed to be conversationally saying, and what I was trying to do, um, what I was trying to do, so Rauner's got this optimistic story, and I try to broaden it then from an individual optimism, right, to ask the questions, well, how do we need to do this work of evolution relationally, okay, and that's where, right, but even my inclusion of this expansion from the individual to the relational may not be enough. Evolution has become a new story. But it depends on what we look at and how we look at things, whether we assess that things are evolving. Rahner's vision is exceedingly optimistic. And when I, when I use this idea again, I'm going to put in Bob and say, in a sense, Rahner has us doing evolution. He's exceedingly optimistic with the sense that all human beings, regardless of their time or place in life's context, are equally open to this unlimited horizon of transcendence. <coughs> but his optimistic thinking, that becoming is always becoming more, it might be heard as an all too familiar story of human progress, that things are getting better, or look how far we've come. But then I'm haunted by the invitation from Vatican II when Catholics were reminded of the need to scrutinize the signs of the times. While things may seem like they are evolving, opening up new possibilities for who we are as human beings, Perhaps the limited scope of my own experience requires a more complex lens. For me, Mark Lewis Taylor provides such a lens, because instead of an individual human person constituted by matter and spirit evolving toward God, as Rahner would have us, Taylor situates the human person inextricably within the social fabric. We are ontologically in our very being as human beings thoroughly enmeshed in relation to others, where matter and spirit emerge in sociality as we share our lives and our space with others. This, for Taylor, is the very basis of our being. There is no human becoming apart from its intimate interrelation with others, materially and spiritually. Ideally, Taylor writes, we as human persons could relate to one another in what he describes as, and I quote, we could relate to one another in, quote, a delicate spacing of bodies involving both mutual intimacy and the distancing of bodies, end quote. In the dimension of matter, as Rahner frames it, we could be experiencing intimate relations between bodies that could give rise to a shared evolution of spirit. And yet, while this potential power equilibrium should ontologically and could theoretically frame our existence as human beings, our world, in Taylor's vision, is tragically characterized not by delicate spacing, where the weight of the world is shared equally among us. Instead of delicate balance, the weight of the world is shifted onto some and released from others. As Taylor explains, and I quote, shifting names what happens when the delicate spacing of world bodies is disrupted. The results are not extension, relation, and spacing in a singular plural world but masses, gatherings, crowdings, crammings, accumulations, demographic spurts, exterminations, and so on, end quote. Instead of, delicate instead of delicate spacing of intimacy and relationality, a disequilibrium is maintained in our world by the constant exertion of power. Instead of the individual striving only towards self-transcendence, all human beings are inevitably situated in the, in the push and pull of a constant struggle. The privileged struggle to maintain their position and well-being, while the dispossessed struggle to achieve well-being. The struggle, Taylor names, includes striving for bodily securities, capital in both the economic and material senses. But for Taylor, it also includes the struggle for recognition, which he captures with the idea of symbolic capital. And, and he writes, 
There is, this is, these are Taylor's words, there is both an egoistic pursuit of self-love and a fascination with and need to secure approval of others. Glory, honor, credit, praise, fame, these make up the currency of symbolic capital, end quote. With the struggle of survival and the struggle to secure approval, Taylor provides a framework through which to scrutinize the signs of our times and our ideas about evolution. Each one of us is necessarily interconnected through networks and relationships. Enmeshed in those relationships, we are, as Rahner might say, invested in matter and material well-being, while also impacted on the level of spirit, insofar as we are seeking recognition. Simply put, human being is steeped in this weighted world. Bodies and their dispositions are shaped by a struggle for recognition and the accumulation of capital. Using Taylor's framework to interrogate evolution, we might ask precisely who it is that benefits and who it is that is dispossessed in the shifting weight of our present world. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the undoing evolution in the, in the, in the first kind of um, layer of this right now, but I want, before I move on, to have a, a sense of if I can explain what it is that Taylor's doing um, and why I find it compelling. Do you have a sense uh, of this idea of um, shifting balance and the weight of the world? With, with Taylor, yes, okay, right? So these, these interrelations right, are not neutral. They, are, they could be relations that, of where power shifts, <coughs> right? But what they have become is, is power struggles. And they have become power struggles that have shifted the weight of the world onto some and released it from others. Right? I found Taylor's framework um, uh, compelling um, and then also to use it to scrutinize the signs of the times. Um, this is the place where, um, this is what is new in my theology, and I, and I know that there's something there that has to be wrestled with, um, and Taylor helps me to name it, um, but I'm, I'm admitting at this stage, um, uh, I don't know how we, uh, I don't know where we need to go next with it, so, so let me, let me um, continue then with, with Taylor. Using frame, Taylor's framework to interrogate evolution, we might ask precisely who it is that benefits and who it is that's dispossessed in the shifting weight of our present world. Who among us struggles for quality education, home ownership, and economic stability? Who among us benefits from the struggle to access physical well-being that is a universal human condition? Upon whom has the weight of our world been shifted? In terms of economic stability, the Pew Research Center starkly reports that in the United States, and I quote them, the median wealth of white households is 20 times that of black households and 18 times that of Hispanic households, end quote. Wealth disparities around, along race lines indicate poverty disproportionately weighs upon persons of color, as indicated also by home ownership and personal assets. Access to education intertwines with this racialized financial disparity. When the Chronicle of Higher Education can report that nearly 30% of whites in the US hold a degree from a four-year college, while 17% of black and 13% of Latinos do. This building on an 80% high school graduation rate for whites, where with only a 62% for uh, graduation rate for blacks, 68% for Latinos, and a 51% high school graduation rate for Native Americans. Health disparities as well illumine a disproportionate number of black and Latino Americans uninsured, with health measures like diabetes and infant mortality favoring white Americans. Incarceration rates for black and Latino Americans further demonstrates that the weight of the world, the weight of our world, has been racialized. On nearly every measure of our human landscape, the weight of our world falls disproportionately on men, women, and children of color. The question then becomes, how are we, as a human family, creating or denying the conditions for transcendence, the possibilities for evolution as positive growth? How have we created conditions for some and not for others? The reason I think it's necessary to introduce Taylor to both Rahner and my conception of our evolutionary trajectory is that while motherhood may expand from the individual to the multiple, we need to expand even further to recognize those places 
where the limits of our circle of concern actually see our evolution, or a narrow communal evolution, at the expense of our others. We need to be self-aware that our perception of what counts as evolutionary growth for some may have been at the expense of others. And on each of these markers of human well-being, we can see a tragic history of political and legal decisions which prioritized the growth, transcendence, and evolution of white Americans over, our racialized, uh, over other racialized populations. We see over 200 years of enslavement of Africans for the building of white colonies and white industry. We see the dispossession of Native peoples from their land, not only to expand white land ownership from colonial times through the 20th century, but also to use the sale of Indian lands to establish educational institutions for white Americans in the mid-19th century. We see the legalized enactment of social safety nets, like Social Security and the Federal Housing Administration, whose racialized policies kept benefits of home ownership and Social Security from African Americans in the 20th century. We see continued legislation against migrant workers and undocumented immigrants while employing their work power to feed and serve our nation. As Christians and people of faith intent on evolving, we must come to terms with how our current status rests on the injustice of the past. Mark Taylor's framework and awareness of the data of real human disparities undo the evolutionary optimism of progress and suggest that there may be real work that needs to be done to undo these past injustices through which some have evolved at the dehumanization and the expense of others. So I thought this would be a good time to ask the question, how do we come to terms with an evolutionary story that seems to suggest things are getting better when so many among the human family continue to struggle under the weight of our world? What do we do with the optimistic evolutionary story when clearly the evolution of some has been at the expense of others? So this is my second selling point, still on time. Um, and I'll just share with you, um, this section of my work is, is new, and it comes out of um, my work with our Dorothy Day Center for Service and Justice at the University, because this wasn't a part of my theological training, right? The, 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 the sense of, um, the, sense of um, the, the possibilities of our evolutionary growth, right? We're never really attentive to um, what sorts of, of, of costs might be um, involved when this takes place in a in a, a world where we are reliant on one another for our well-being. Um, so what I have is a, um, a document that I put together um, only about six months ago, where I, where I was really kind of stunned by the Pew report um, that, that white households had a, have a median net worth uh, within the white households 20 times that of blacks and Latinos. Um, and then I began to just put together some data and really for me, this was my way of, of, of giving um, picture, texture, data to um, Taylor's question about the weight of our world. Um, so I share it with you just as a way of putting the data that I have in my head around some of these legislated disparities, um, putting that, what I have in my head into a more, uh, having the content um, to continue our conversation. So while you're processing this, I think this is going to take me some years to process all of this, right? While, while I'm processing along with, um, I, it's too early to ask the question, what do you do with this data in light of this story of evolution that seems so positive and progressive, um, that things are getting better? Um, it could be the distribution of the handout, it could be the weight of the world. <laughs> you, do, you, do you see um, this, so this is my, maybe my third or my fourth move here. Do you see the weight of this, this optimistic evolutionary story and then the data of our human family? Um, yeah, please. Yeah, I not only see it, but I feel it. It's real heavy. And I wondered why or where are the orange 
Yes, it's very heavy um, physically. Um, is there a reason why the Orientals are not included in this, or are they included in one of the other groups? Or? Yeah, so, so there is a, a, it's a very, very good question. There is a column um, where uh, the Asian populations are included, um, and some of that, and I'm still, I'm still finding the best way to respond to that, um, some of it is the newer immigration, the, the newer, um, uh, the newer demographic of more recent immigration among Asian populations, so that the disparities that we see, so the disparities of black and white, um, we can trace those historically, and we can see the legislations that were put into place that dispossessed um, African Americans in this country, under slavery, under Jim Crow, under, you know, all the way up through the 20th century. Um, we can see that same pattern of dispossession with Native American peoples, um, we can see a different sort of a dynamic, um, of, but a, a different sort of a dynamic, but still kind of the generational dispossession of Latino um, uh, Americans. I think that the Asian population, um, both it doesn't have that historic weight and that the, that the conditions under which the newer waves of immigration are coming are coming with resources so that they're so that they are they often fall very close to um, uh, uh, the demographic of, of economic well-being and health well-being that white populations do but that was not part of my theological training by the way right so this is a whole right so the, the sense in which what it means to scrutinize the signs of the times Right, means that my disciplinary grounding in, in, in theology right, needs to do some other work, needs to, needs to really be thinking from and learning from other disciplines. Does this get you into liberation theology at all? This, liberating these people? This, this, uh, great question. This is liberation. <laughs> process theology, liberation theology, feminist theology. Okay. Um, a part of my training was as a, so part of my training uh, as, a, as a Christian theologian did a lot of work with liberation theology, did a lot of work with, with black theology. I think that the place where liberation theology is now in North America is for white theologians to say, right, this isn't about blacks and Latino, this is about us and the kinds of choices that Christians have made historically Right, that that liberation theology. I think in my training, liberation theology was well. That's what's happening in Latin America, right? Um, black theology. Well, this is great that 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 our African American theologians and our African American community have found voice and can give voice to their own struggle, right? And that's what liberation theology, black theology. But I think that this for me is going it, to. It uses the tools of liberation theology, right, to say that we've got a, we've got some undoing to do. Um, but yes, it, it is. It's, it's kind of my own my own thinking about what would liberation theology look like if I didn't think of it as over there in Latin America, but I thought of it as right here in my comfortable North American suburb. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think one thing about uh, Carl Rahner's uh, perspective on evolution might need some rethinking. Sure. And um, and certainly he was strongly influenced by the, the, the ideas of evolution at the time that he was there, that it's competitive, that the way evolution occurs is, you know, you compete for the best resources and in so doing you evolve. Well, uh, that is, so Rahner doesn't necessarily, he doesn't necessarily frame it as competitive. He thinks that this evolutionary growth is possible for everyone. The, the problem that I have with Rahner is that he frames it individual, it's too individualized. Right, and right? I agree with yeah. from that standpoint. Yeah. And so the second part that I think scientists are thinking a lot more now is about cooperation. And so what I would say is that as humans, it's not that we need to undo evolution per okay. se, mm -hmm. but that we need to really do it. And we need to think about when it is that cooperation is equally valuable uh, or more valuable mm -hmm. than competition and use you know, these, uh, this very positive, optimistic worldview to sort out that so that we can learn what it means to be cooperative. So some of what your conversation is doing um, would bring some theologians up to speed, right? So Rohner is writing in the middle of the 20th century, and, and you know, at that point, 
You know, there were people who were saying, well, evolution, we, you know, oh, we can't, we can't buy into that. And science, right, in those 50 years or so, has, has changed, right? So, so there are some theologians who are, so um, uh, a little plug, one of my colleagues, Elizabeth Johnson, a feminist theologian who some of you may be familiar with, she wrote a book, um, She Who Is, and she has a new one, um, she had a new one, Quest for Living God. She's just written um, a, a very new book, it's called Ask the Beasts, and it's um, Darwin, and the God of Love, where she's saying, okay, so how do we take not just Darwin, but movements of science since then, um, so that we don't have this competitive notion, right? And, and that is really kind of even adjusting the mental perception of what evolution might, might mean, right? The, the third thing would be evolution is um, um, stochastic. And so, what is um, that? Uh, so in other words, it, um, it has a surprise element to it. Oh, yeah. Randomness associated, okay. random associated uh -huh. with it. And so then the question for Christians is, can we facilitate the randomness in the direction we want? Yeah, yeah. So evolution is potentially a great new story that, to keep thinking theologically. Thanks. And just to build really briefly on your comment, Linda, about the changes in the way that science thinks about evolution, I was at the Smithsonian two weeks ago with my kids over spring break, and we went to the Human Evolution Exhibit, and there's a lot of focus, actually, in that exhibit on explaining hey, human evolution as a process of cooperation, that it was our ancestors learning to cooperate, and that that's why we're here. <laughs> Okay, then I like this, we not only need to do evolution, we need to really do it, is that what I like that? And there's a question in the back too, maybe these last two, and then uh, the, next, the next movement is a little break, so maybe we go for as long as you want here, and then take a little break and then come back, there's a, a last movement. Uh, another new uh, movement or idea in the process of evolution is that uh, the interconnectedness, and that is the experience, can actually change the genome. It's this idea of epigenetics. And that's a whole new concept, how we're evolving. So the dynamic of what's going on around can actually change the DNA yeah. expression. Yeah. And that's an important idea. Yeah. So the, so the sense of the, I don't know, plasticity of who yes. we are as human yes. beings? Yes. Wow. I like that. Yeah, I, I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit lost here, <laughs> but trying to follow you with the theology part, yes. which has been even hard for me already. But then now you, you mix it with economic and politics and power right. and civil rights, which are totally, you know, a little bit, I mean, you, could, you, you might not believe in God or kill all the Indians, you know, like, I don't know, <laughs> not be a theology, so. You know, when you, when you look at the history that you're talking about, mm -hmm. the old world, the new world, the European coming to this country, I mean, there's, there's a lot to look at these numbers. And so I'm having a hard time to follow in the theology with the politics and the economics and the civil rights of the 60s yeah. yep. to follow you. So okay. what that means? So. Yeah, no, that's a very helpful intervention. Um, and and, and <laughs> let me, let me, uh, let oh, me wait, tie wait. together I, my three movements. I see um, there's a bunch of pipes, you know, circles coming together and power. Well, because this is, this is power here, you know, like, you know, who dominates who, and who controls who. And I mean, it, you go back to the 60s and people couldn't even vote in the South. So who's going to have the money? Um, you know. So so let me let me answer uh, let me answer directly, and let me then then let me anticipate what I what I, I I can answer in three ways. One is to see theology not as a project that's just up here, right, in our thoughts and in our ideas, or in a God who is only transcendent from the world. Right? but that a Christian theological affirmation of God's living reality within the world right, is kind of the first move that, that, that I have to make as clear as possible. Right? And, the, and, and making that as clear as possible is to say, okay, if I think about the project of theology as just talking about a transcendent God that's beyond this world, then you're right. Politics, civil rights, economics, that's really not relevant to theology, right? 
Uh, but if I have a theological affirmation that says that God who created the cosmos and brought it into existence infuses our creation and desires the well-being of that creation, right? then politics that are unjust and economics that are unjust and practices that are unjust are very much theological, right? Because either they, in, either they um, uh, infuse the world with the grace that God desires for the world, right? Or they compromise the human experience of God's good creation. So that's the, that's kind of the first theological shift to say. And 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 there were. I like that you framed it so clearly because there's work that I've been doing in theology that talks about um, the reality of religious difference. And it talks about it all on a theological up here sort of ideas level, right? And it doesn't really touch down and say, how have Christian ideas about people of other faiths made a difference in terms of people of other faiths having different political rights than Christians do? How have the decisions that Christians have made dispossessed people who don't, didn't share their worldview? And that's actually the next movement of what I'm getting to. That, that, that actually looking at some of this legislation, looking at some of this data, what I'm very interested in as a theologian is to say, where were those places that Christian theology didn't just respond to an unjust situation, but where Christian theology created the conditions for an unjust situation? And that's where, right, that's where, so I've got all of this, that's where the, you know, the, all of this work that I have to do in a, outside of my discipline and understanding what's the landscape and the data and economics and things that are beyond me, right, then I have to say, well, how did, the, how did our theological thinking inform some of that? How, and, and how does our theological thinking help us to undo some of that? Um, follow yeah. up, yeah. No, if I could make a comment, there's a lot of gold if I could make a comment, I went to Spain twice and I saw a lot of gold that came from Mexico and That's Peru right. and Inca That's right. of all the ones that were killed that went to Europe. So That's right. say, That's they, right. were, they were very theological, yeah. you know, the very there's religious. A, there's a chapel in the Sistine, there's a chapel in the, in the Vatican, I think it's, I don't know which one it is. That is, that, that is gold that was, that was brought over from Columbus, and it announces it that way, right? And what do we, right? What do we do with that? What do we do as Christians, as people of faith, right? How do we do this differently? That's the next movement in the second half of the discussion. Do we want to get up and take a break and walk around a little bit? Right. Okay, a quick, a quick comment, and then we'll get up and stretch. Um, in the early 90s, um, Bishop Desmond Tutu came uh, to speak at, at, as one of the Montfort um, at one of the Montfort lectures, and he began his lectures by thanking thanking us, thanking all those students, all the people there, who because they in the 60s students took took part in in the movement to end um, you know apartheid. And that's an ex that's an example of the positive that that's we're talking about. That's right, and that's where that's where, as a theologian, I want to say I can see where theology has contributed negatively, and I can see those those trajectories that have made a positive difference from out of our faith perspective. So thank you for that, because I think that that's always what we have to hold intention that it doesn't help us just to say, oh, Christian theology is bad. You know, it it, it also is a liberating. Uh, trajectory as well. So why don't we do five minutes or just get up and stretch? <laughs> one, uh, one section and then kind of something that's a little bit more like a little story. And I think that I might do it all, but we'll see how you're feeling. Okay, so While we can see that the evolutionary story of progress has been built on the labor and exploitation of others, it's important to take seriously the history that Christians have not been mere reactors to the processes by which some have evolved at the expense of others. Christians have actively enacted these barriers to our others' well-being on social and religious grounds. 
The doctrine of discovery, which dispossessed native peoples of their land here in the U.S., was legalized as an 1823, in an, in an 1823 Supreme Court decision which traced ownership of land to the Pope's pronouncement that gave rights to Christians over pagans. Legally, 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 uh, um, so, so one of the, uh, see, uh, we could be here all night. Um, the, the indigenous activist um, religious scholars that I've been, that I've been only newly um, uh, in, uh, aware of um, really say that some of the, the difficulties within indigenous rights here in the U.S. today right, are based on this legal decision from 1823, which was based on the Pope's the Pope's claim of Christianization, right? They gave rights to Christians over pagans. So that this is not just an 1823 decision or a 16th century document. It's something that continues to impact the lives of indigenous peoples in this country. Sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, in the desire for the salvation of souls, white Christians erased native practices and native wisdoms which was seen as a project of progress and civilization required for the evolution of the people who needed to evolve beyond their pagan darkness. Founding ideologies legitimating slavery were based on theologies of religious supremacy that identified African peoples as Muslim and justified enslavement on religious grounds. White Christians continued to enslave African others on the assumptions that white Christianity was the highest form of religion, and that the more evolved race should have rights and religious responsibility over the superstitious other. The ideologies which provided theoretical and theological legitimation for the many discriminations that created disparities were rooted in evolutionary thinking, where white European expressions of religion, culture, and race were the pinnacle of progress, justifying the, colonia the colonization and exploitation of those who were religiously, culturally, and racially other. What we need, clearly, is a construction of religious identity that does not come at the expense of our others. If previous constructions of Christian identity inform these injustices, how might we reconceive Christian identity such that it authentically learns from and grows with those who are other, racially, culturally, religiously? Here's where I've been influenced by theorists of globalization to see the need for a cosmopolitan outlook. I want to use the globalization theorists to add another layer to our story of evolution by helping us think about the material conditions that have been part of our world and influencing this trajectory of thought in the last 500 years. Here, evolution as a story, as a new story, needs to be situated in the modern landscape with its story of globalization. Sociologist Roland Robertson uses the term globalization to refer both to the compression of the world and the intensification of consciousness of the world as a whole. Under the impact of global systems of information, economics, migration, and travel, which bind together previously disparate locations, we increasingly have the sense of the world as a single place. Globalization has its roots in the expansion of Western European empires that created routes, and connected lands in pursuit of economic and religious dominance. The rise of science and evolutionary discourse coincides with the material and political landscape of globalization. Globalization invites us to see evolutionary discourse spilling over from science and spirituality and informing economic, social, and political practices that would require the evolutionary development of nations to come into line with the empires of the West. These same lines of communication also, uh, these same lines of communication, travel, and economic joining have also made it possible for multi-religious others to move through these systems, creating places where religious difference is found very close to home. Evolution and globalization are two meta-narratives that give us a sense of the world we live in today. The world as a single place is going somewhere. It has a past and a future. But as we've seen, the past includes injustices that brought out the material well-being of some at the expense of others, such that the evolutionary process itself, through the lens of globalization, might be characterized by Taylor's description where, where the struggle for well-being is the struggle for all. How do we shape a religious identity in this landscape? My proposal is that we need to shape ourselves with cosmopolitan religious identities 
in an interconnected, multi-religious world for the possibility of our evolving together toward the future. Our first step is to move carefully through the logic of religious identity, guided by the insight of Elizabeth Spellman, who reminds us, and I quote her, since people can be classified and cataloged in any number of ways, overlapping ways, how we catalog them, in particular, how we sort out the overlapping distinctions, will depend on our purposes and our sense of what the similarities and differences among them are and how they should be weighed, end quote. Michel Foucault has an interesting description of the modern tendency to want to put things into clear categories. In his 1966 The Order of Things, he describes the 18th and 19th century with the flowering of a science that sought to put every living thing in its place and to describe the order and relations among them. Darwin's The Origin of the Species is precisely puzzling over the scientific approach to separate things out and is trying to understand better the relationship among the variously identified life forms. It's in this era, with the emergence of anthropology as a science that categorized cultures, that the formations of the religions as clear and distinct categories emerged within the study of religion. As this was also the time of empire in the West, the categorization of cultures and religions took on a hierarchical ordering which places the culture or which placed the culture and religion of Europe as the highest form. So this sense of um, thinking about how we would construct a religious identity in this new landscape. I wanted to go back to some of the places where religious identity was formed, or sorry, the notion of, 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 of um, categorizing religions and the identities that came along with that was formed in this era of really thinking about things in very clear and defined and separated out categories, right? Um, and so that's a movement that happens within science. It's a movement that happens within, within the, the emergence of, of anthropology and the emergence of the study of religion. And it's in contrast to that, I think, that we need to think about our religious identity in a different way. Um, and yet, while we have moved toward the desire to resist the ordering of other religions hierarchically so that our religion wins out as the best, there remains a tendency still to categorize ourselves and our religious others with clear and, dis and defining distinctions. Too often, in the landscape of religious identity, we define ourselves by who we are not. In this logic of identity, boundaries are established and criteria identified to determine who's in and who's out of the collective. As one set of prominent researchers described, and I quote them, all religious groups need boundaries. Boundaries strengthen collective identity by showing clearly who are members and who are not. And the maintenance of boundaries requires clear rules and markers, end quote. Taking Catholic identity as the center of their concern, this group of researchers go on to offer that American Catholicism has four main boundaries, and they argue, and I quote them, if any one of these boundaries become blurry, Catholic identity over and against the outside the border region will become confused, and many young Catholics will begin to wonder if the boundary makes sense, end quote. So one approach to the pluralism which globalization has brought is to ensure the clear establishment of boundaries and criteria for particular religious identities. While the clarity of this approach may be appealing, we know who we are by contrasting ourselves with who we are not, it runs some real risks. As Linnell Elizabeth Cady writes, and I quote, indeed a major response to the increase, increased pluralism and globalization of life has been a reassertion of tightly bounded personal and communal identities, what some have called tribalization, end quote. Seeking religious identity over and against our others can manifest in a fortress mentality that experiences one's own faith and tradition as under siege. And so one way of dealing with this uh, globalized reality of our world is to construct religious identity over and against, carving out very clear definitions and clear boundaries of who's in and who's out of collectives. Um, I have a, a note here that says, I wonder if you have any examples of religious identities <laughs> being under siege. Um, but Joachim already cited um, Weigel's way of kind of talking about the Catholic difference. Um, and I suspect there are other examples of uh, constructing a religious identity as kind of over and against the others and under siege. And I wanted to bring that to mind because that's what I'd like to contrast with a cosmopolitan religious identity. 
I take the idea of cosmopolitan religious identity from sociologist and theorist of globalization, Ulrich Beck. Beck looks around at the globalized landscape and he says, look, we have a choice in how we orient ourselves towards difference. Sure, we can imagine ourselves under siege and construct a boundary around ourselves and our tribe. And this is largely, largely what's been done in modernity. The construction of a tribal identity could, could lead to simple indifference about our religious others. But Beck sees tribalization as supported by an unspoken establishment of hierarchical difference, since we look out from our tribe and judge ourselves to be the best. So in Beck's view, there remains a tendency that could be seen in the 19th century philosophers and theologians who did look out, um, who categorized religions very clearly and then placed Christianity as the, as the, as the <coughs> tradition toward which, as the religion toward which all the others wanted to evolve toward. Um, and Beck says that sometimes that hierarchical ordering can still be present in our viewing of others. He suggests that, Beck goes on to suggest that beyond indifference or hierarchical difference, um, we, we may have moved or some have moved in modernity towards tolerance and acceptance of other identities. Yet Beck suggests that this can sometimes take the form of what he calls sameness universalism. And he writes, universalism obliges us to respect others as equal in principle. Yet for that very reason does not involve any requirement that would inspire curiosity or respect for what makes others different. On the contrary, the particularity of others is sacrificed to an assumed universal equality which denies its own origins and interests. Sameness universalism rests on the assumption that, hey, we're all the same, so we don't need to spend too much time on the differences among our identities. But Beck suggests that this presents the situation where the voice of the other is granted a hearing only as the voice of sameness and self-confirmation. By contrast, Beck offers a constructive proposal for a different sort of approach to difference, which he captures with the idea of cosmopolitanism. He described instead a stance in which persons simultaneously view themselves as part of a narrow, localized collective, which might be bound by some elements of sameness, and simultaneously as part of a wider global world interconnected with those who are different. In his words, a cosmopolitan outlook is one in which people view themselves simultaneously as part of a threatened world and as part of their local situations and histories. Cosmopolitan vision does not see oneself cut off from those who are different in an enclave of distinctiveness, <coughs> but interwoven with the lives and futures of those whose culture, religion, and outlook are different. These differences are not the source of hierarchical assessment or indifference or painting all the same. Rather, the differences themselves enhance the encounter and provide resources for thinking together about our common future. Cosmopolitan religious identity would require that we recognize those many ways that our religious identity has been constructed from out of conversation and engagement with diverse ideologies and different religious traditions. By Beck's description, it would also require that we see our past and our future wrapped up with the well-being of those who are not members of our own community. With the cosmopolitan religious identity, one commits both to the distinctiveness of a particular community and to the well-being of all, not by ignoring, erasing, or judging their differences to be less than our way of being, but by engaging in relationships across differences, relationships of mutual transformation of ourselves and of our world. Kwame Anthony Apia helps us to envision the pursuit of a cosmopolitan vision for religious encounter. As he asserts, and I'm quoting him, cosmopolitans suppose that all cultures have enough overlap in their vocabulary of values to begin a conversation. But they don't suppose, like some universalists, that we could all come to, a, to agreement if only we had the same vocabulary, end quote. In the United States and in many parts of our world, globalization's transnational dynamic has brought religious difference close to home. The religious other is neighbor, colleague, and friend whom we meet in our complex identities and whose presence may positively alter our theological reflection. It's time, I think, for our religious traditions to embrace a cosmopolitan vision in pursuit of dynamic religious identity for a globalized world. In the process, living, 
breathing, embodied interreligious encounters in their many and diverse forms may foster a theological shift in our appreciation of religious difference. As Appiah notes, social practices and ideologies change not so much from reasoned arguments across difference, but from getting to know people who hold different views. Globalization's transnational dynamic and interreligious encounter provides a unique opportunity then for remaking religious identities as cosmopolitan responses to our interconnected world. As a Catholic theologian, I want to encourage a cosmopolitan Catholicism that engages with our religious, cultural, and racial others. I see it as nothing less than the call of the gospel to evolve together, but this means undoing past injustices and creating a cosmopolitan religious identity which is committed to the future, not only for ourselves, but for our others. And so I'd like to spend some time talking about uh, the concept of a cosmopolitan religious identity, how that both commits to a particular tradition and commits to our, our world where we're living together. Uh, but I'd like to, I think I'll close with, um, with, uh, with this. It's not my story, it's, Jesus. It's, it's, it's the New Testament writer's story, but it's a story nonetheless. My conclusion. So as I lean forward on my mat and in my life, I need to ask myself, how am I creating conditions under which not only I am evolving, but as a committed Christian, I am creating conditions under which others might evolve as well? One of my favorite stories from the New Testament offers a lens to see this practice as deeply Christian and deeply religious, indeed, the heart of the project of salvation. It's from Luke 10, one of my favorite stories. A lawyer interrogates Jesus on the feasibility and practicality of his vision when he asks, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Really, Jesus replies. <laughs> you and I both know what's written in the heart of Torah. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Do this, and you will live. I love that story. I love that story because it could wrap up so nicely right there. Jesus calling his fellow Jew back to the heart of their religious tradition. It's brilliant in its simplicity and it's striking in its vision. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you will live. But I love the story even more because the gospel writer spins the story further. Because like all of us hearers of this story, the lawyer calculated the costs of this process of growth and giving. Because he says, yes, I know, love God, love neighbor. And he says, what does he say next? And who is my neighbor? I love that. Is my neighbor my tribe, my race, my religion? Really, Jesus, how far is my concern, my love for neighbor supposed to extend? Really, who is my neighbor? And it's at this point that Jesus tells the story of what comes to be known as the story of the Good Samaritan. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell in the hands of robbers, stripped and beaten, went away, leaving half dead. But we've heard the story of the Good Samaritan so often, I think we hardly hear its point. As I write in my book, I think Christians have become complacent in their hearing of it, identifying themselves not with the pious leaders who walk past the man to leave him in his suffering, but seeing themselves in the Good Samaritan. When the Christian hearer of this first century tale too easily identifies with the Good Samaritan, it sometimes comes at the expense of Judaism, as the Christian hearer uh, scoffs at those who walk by, uh, and they see them, as the pious leaders are seen as Jews, sorry, and the Good Samaritan as something other. And too often, I suspect, the Christian hearer scoffs at those who walk by precisely because they are Jews, and sees the Samaritan as some sort of a proto-Christian. But if we hear this story and too easily identify ourselves with the Samaritan, we are missing something that Jesus' hearers would have heard. That is, in answer to the question, who is my neighbor, Jesus doesn't go to the leaders of the community, we know that, but he doesn't even go to the margins of his community. In answer to the fundamental question of what pattern, reaches, what pattern brings life, Jesus reaches outside the community, outside of his own community, and raises the other the despised as the model to follow toward salvation. The Samaritan would have been seen as someone culturally and religiously other to Jesus' hearers. 
Yet while the Samaritan and Jew were separated by cultural and religious differences and divisions, while they were considered foreign to one another, the Samaritan nevertheless somehow saw his life wrapped up in the life of the broken other. It was the Samaritan, the outsider, who bound his life up with the man broken by the side of the road. It was the Samaritan who brought him life, and in doing so, bound himself up with the life of the other. In the story that has, been, that has come to be known as the Good Samaritan, those who passed by were unwilling to forego their symbolic capital, tethered as it was to maintaining distance from the defiled. They walked past the dying man, careful to avoid taking on the weight of his defilement, which could compromise the fragile status they struggled to maintain. Placing myself as a white Christian theologian in the position of those careful to secure their status, Jesus' call instead is a radical love of neighbor in a terribly weighted world. To follow the path instead of the Samaritan, who may have held no symbolic capital, but was willing to forego other forms of capital for the well-being of the one on whom the weight of the world had fallen. The disruption of the precarious ontological balance of intimacy and distance recognizable as we scrutinize the signs of our times and interpret them through the gospel lens of love, means to follow this practice of care for self and other. For in holding the story of the stranger on the side of the road and the example he affords, the inquisitive lawyer sees clearly the message of eternal life promised as the result of love of God and neighbor, as Jesus lifts up the model of the Samaritan, willing to relinquish his own well-being and enjoins, do this and you will live. My question in closing is this. To what extent does the new story of evolution afford the space for us to put our own transcendence on hold and to make the necessary sacrifices of our own evolutionary well-being to lift up those on whom the weight of our world has fallen so that we might both transcend together? To, to talk about. Um, you, you've got my, my first few, few movements in terms of evolution and, and seeing the, the underside of what we imagine as evolution. Um, our Christian responsibility, um, I will speak as a Christian and a Catholic theologian to say, I think it's our, my responsibility then to see those places where Christian theology um, can do a better job of, of, of evolving toward um, something better. Um, and that piece on, on cosmopolitan identity um, has to do with the fact that, that evolution isn't just about us as individuals, um, but that somehow if we're using this conceptualization, um, we're, we're thinking about existence as a whole, and so we have to start thinking about ways of constructing religious identity that allow us to do this work across boundaries. Um, uh, because that's not traditionally the way that Christians have, have worked necessarily is, is across religious boundaries. Um, and so that cosmopolitan religious identity um, asks us to think about what are the ways that we can shape our religious identities so that we're thinking about all this work that needs to be done and we're doing it across religious, um, uh, uh, across religious traditions and in solidarity across religious traditions. Um, so those are the last couple movements there. Um, Thoughts or questions? But that I'm a teacher, that's the worst way. Thoughts, questions, right? Okay. But we do, right? Opens up something. So I uh, want to make sure I have it right. The basics of what you're trying to get across here, it seems revolutionary, I guess you could say, uh, in light of Christ. Mm -hmm. Are we to say that Charles Darwin uh, we would look at his theory of evolution and say, okay, you've, you've diagnosed the problem. Now the treatment of the issue the problem, as it has been developed, natural selection and so forth, has gone off course. And we see ways that historically, as Christians, we've gone off course mm -hmm. in relation to the Indians or indigenous people or whichever group we want to talk about. But we're saying that maybe the point is not 
necessarily humans, but Christ himself, that there is a focus to the development of uh, whatever, the treatment of the problem, the uh, flawed nature that we have, or um, I, I think that the, that la the last piece of what you just uh, articulated, I think that what I, um, I think that what I'm envisioning is that the deep stories of our traditions give us ways of thinking about um, moving forward. Um, and so for me, the stories of, of Christian scripture provide ways of being human, um, that do reach out in care for others, that do attend to those who've been marginalized. And maybe in a sense, there are stories of, of Christian scripture that really say that this, that, that there are human postures, right, that could be uh, uh, part of this evolutionary project, not just for oneself, but for others. Right, so, so I don't know that if that last piece is different from the way that you articulated it. Rahner would have said the whole project is, is tending towards Christ. He would have said that both in terms of incarnation and in terms of where we're going as human beings. Um, but given that I'm thinking with the diversity of religious traditions, I'm, I'm, I'm less, uh, I, I, articul I don't articulate it quite in that unidirectional way in terms of Christ. I see... Um, I see the Christian witness as one that provides a framework for our thinking about, about what would it look like for us really um, to, to reach out, not just for our own well-being, but for the well-being of others. Um, and and I, I, um, uh, Mark Taylor's analysis of our selfishness and our struggle and our need for our own security <coughs> Um, to me, is such a great diagnosis that then the, the Christian response, the stories of Jesus, to me are just remarkable descriptions of what would it look like if we were willing to relinquish, right, what we have and 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 share it in common, right. So for me, it's more of narratives, right, that um, might might help us think in an evolutionary way. An important point being, right, that my Muslim neighbors may have a different narrative. Right, that might help us think about another way of, of, of narrating this process of evolution. So if evolution is a story, right, how do we use the evolutionary story and the ancient stories of the Christian tradition? How do those, how do those come together? I think that's part of the project of, 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 that Christian theologians have been undertaking, and maybe it's part of the project of what this group has been undertaking. But then also to say, um, you know, a Hindu view of who we are as human beings. Does that match or not match this evolutionary view? What 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 does the Hindu um, perspective bring that would be different? And how can I be curious about those differences? Because those differences might help me think, right, about where we're going and how we're getting there, etc. So, yeah, sure. You're making me think of uh, an experience I've had the past year. Last summer, I was all this nomads. And I was looking at all these books on the table. And they had Ilya Delio, who talks about evolution and Christ. And she follows a lot of the uh, Panikar. Mm -hmm. And these people are taking the word Christ and Catholic and stretching it to include everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Matthew Fox, the cosmic Christ. So everything is the cosmic Christ. And I'm wondering if that's, whereas it seems to me what you are suggesting and what the people you're referring to are suggesting is the difference is good. Yeah, that's right. And uh, that might be, you talk about tribalism or same as universalism, and it seems to me to say that, I understand why St. Paul said that. Mm -hmm. He was ethnocentric in a sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he's less evolved than I am, but... <laughs> <laughs> But he was, he was ethnocentric. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that's that's same as universalism mm -hmm. to use the word Catholic and stretch it and use the word Christ and stretch it so that it fits everybody throughout history. Like that's right. Moment. No, that's exactly right. Um, so so Rahner, he, he functioned so well for me in this conversation because his vision was precisely that, right? That, that, that what it is to be human is to be uh, is to be uh, um, 
an image of Christ, right? And that all human beings are tending towards this relationship with God in the same model of what Christians affirm in, in Jesus. Um, and so he, you know, he, he, he really did kind of stretch Christian. He's the theologian who had the famous anonymous Christians idea, yes, that basically said, you know, a, a good Hindu is a good Hindu because he or she is an anonymous Christian. Like, oh. <laughs> my Hindu friends don't, not only do my Hindu friends, well, some of my Hindu friends would say, okay, from your perspective, I can see that, but that's the, the move of sameness universalism that no longer, I'm no longer curious about, about how God may have encountered that group of people in a way different from how God might have encountered me in my own tradition. Um, and so for me, it's a, it's a, it's wanting to hold both the affirmation that I think that I think that I would like to formulate my life to the best of my ability in the pattern of Jesus, and and I would like to live as if Christ lived in me, right? And I and I would like to do that. Um, but I also think that perhaps the generous God of creation allows for diverse ways for people to be fully human. Um, and I think that that's the place where, uh, where uh, a cosmopolitan identity says, yes, I'm committed to this way of being, but I'm also committed to the well-being of, of my neighbors who are, who are different from me, who are really quite different from me. Um, and so the move of the cosmopolitan really asks us to, to both be committed right, to, to particular ways of being in the world, but also to see you know, we're in this world together. Um, and that's really the vision of, of cosmopolitanism, that I think that's the way I'd like to be, Christian. Can, can we do one more question? I think I saw one right over here. Jim, did you have a question? Yeah. It's kind of a two-part question. You have mentioned a number of times that you are a Catholic theologian. Could you, in five or six words, <laughs> Far longer. Help me understand what a Catholic theology is. I don't. Six. I can't do it in five words. Um, I can tell you uh, a little bit of my own story and why I'm willing to uh, uh, self identify as a Catholic theologian. Um, I was raised in a Roman Catholic church, um, a very vibrant Roman Catholic church. Uh, the way that I think about the world is sacramental. That, that's just the way I think about the world. I, I was shaped to be attentive to those places where God is, is revealing God's self in, in lots of different ways in the world, right? And so I can say, okay, that way, of, that way of thinking about where God is in the world can trace to, you know, my, uh, a, a set of deep Catholic roots. So fundamentally in my orientation, in my worldview, I can see that I have deep Catholic roots in, in, in that. Um, but I also live, uh, it may come as a surprise to you, I also live in a very difficult church. Um, that it's very difficult for me to claim uh, that I am Catholic in a church that as I was studying people of other faiths, women's voices, and the experience of gay and lesbians, that my Catholic church, right, was silencing and silencing and silencing, right? And so I, you know, so I've spent the better part of my, I'm being taped. I usually say, don't tell anyone this part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to doctoral studies, uh, master studies, and I didn't check the box. You know, I said, I can't be part of this church anymore, right? The way that it disrespects so many people, right, who are, who are friends and neighbors and loved ones, right? Um, so I went to graduate school, and didn't check the box, and then I realized that the way that I was coming at things, right, was so deeply shaped in a Catholic worldview. Um, and then that I got to the point where I thought, well, it doesn't really make a sense to be, in my, in my own thinking, it didn't make sense for me to be a free-range theologian. Um, and then I had to continue, <laughs> I had to continue to ask myself the question, right, do I want to be part of the groundswell of transformation? Right? Or, or, or have my energies really been exhausted in this place, and do I want to really have my energy somewhere else? Um, and I think that certainly today, um, and certainly in the last, so I, I go through waves. Right? There are times when I'm, uh, I'm at a point right now where I am 
very willing to say that I see my work as part of a groundswell within the Catholic Church. Um, because that's the church of my home and my family. Um, and I've tried to conceptualize my, my spiritual and my religious life in other ways and in other places, and I have just made the choice that for this stretch of time, I'm, I'm committed to being part of the groundswell. Um, so for me, that's what I, so what it means to be a Catholic theologian is to have been shaped by a deep way of thinking, um, and then to be committed to the, to the life of this tradition um, in, in light of its, its problems. And, and, and the reason that I'm willing to stay um, at this stretch, um, I, have, I have two, two very clear reasons. One, I spent a week with a group of women religious a few years ago, right around, uh, right before the time when the leadership conference of women religious was being investigated by the bishops in this country, and their life of faith just reinvigorated me, and I said, this is the kind of Catholic that I want to be. Um, and then a, a, a second um, reason that I'm Catholic in this stretch, um, an Italian Jesuit by the name of um, Paolo Dell'Aglia, um, and you can Google him and you can hear his whole story, and he came to Fordham to talk about um, the work that he does uh, in Syria. Um, he he refounded a monastery out in the desert that brings Christians and Muslims together. They read each other's scriptures. Um, they live together. It's a place of interfaith learning, um, and people come from all over to kind of have this spiritual, you know, this, this, this place away, and this place of interfaith learning. Um, when the war escalated, when the civil war escalated in Syria, um, Paolo was unwilling to, to um, not speak out, and he spoke out, and he was um, removed from the country. Last summer, he returned uh, to Syria, and very soon after was kidnapped. Uh, and when I returned in a very troubled church, um, and, I, and I sat in my very troubled pew, and my priest said, this is my body. I said, well, that makes sense in a different way, and Paolo's the kind of Catholic I want to be. Um, so, so that's why I'm willing. It's in the company of, of, of Catholics who are being cosmopolitan Catholics, who are shaping themselves um, in, in what I think is a, a life of Christian witness. Um, and, and that was not six words, but that's the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to steal. What, what is his name again? Paolo Dal Aglio, D A L L apostrophe O G L I O, um, and it's worth a it's worth a Google, more than worth a Google, and it's worth some prayers. Um, uh, he was kidnapped. Yeah, they, uh, one uh, group claimed to have killed him. Another group claimed that, that he was he was well. We don't know what the situation is. So he's it's worth some prayers, but it's also were the, the Christian witness, right, of being willing to give one's life um, for the God that one believes in across into religious lives. So. Yeah, we're, we're wrapped, we got, who else, who's wrapping us up? Jerry, Jerry. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That was, uh, Quite a finish to a wonderful evening, and thank you, Jim, for asking that question. Um, we have a few more items of business. Um, brief. I'd like to uh, thank Grace Robinson for pointing out to me at the at our intermission that tonight's event was really a perfect bridge between our discussion of evolution this year, and what it means to think about evolution theologically, and our series next year, which we're already hard at work planning, which we envision being about economic justice in the world. And I didn't know when we invited Janine that you were going to be that rich, but you sure planted that for us to step in that direction, so thank you. Um, can you join me in thanking Janine? gift for you from the Theologian in Residence program. And Joachim quote unquote retired from the Theologian in Residence program seven or eight years ago.
years ago. Um, and as you saw this year, his mind and his reading have continued bearing great fruits, and we got a good look at what it takes to give all the talks that he gives, um, and even the introductions that he gives. They're all been helping us invite speakers and select speakers like Janine. Um, and all of that indicates the ways in which he has just stayed on the cutting edge of theology. He has not, however, stayed on the cutting edge of technology. <laughs> And as we watched him um, able to open modern PowerPoint files and things like that this year, we worried that perhaps some of the great insights that he has developed might get lost if they're not properly backed up. And we also are hoping that he will continue to create for us. And so we have this gift um, to help you. Yes, please do open it. <laughs> <laughs> I just finished before this talk talking with David Meyer, and we were going to meet tomorrow night to order. <laughs> well, you can still meet with David, but I think maybe you'll be installing on that. <laughs> So Joe, can, thank you very much on behalf of the Theologian in Residence program for 40 years of fabulous service, and we're looking forward to more. And I think maybe you had some wrap-up words for the community. On a more somber note, uh, our deacon, on a more somber note, our deacon, Leonard Benzel. I had a long talk with him about a week ago about aging and things. People talk to me about aging. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he has had a lot of uh, close calls. But he had a heart attack today and died. So he's, uh, he's had a great life, a very large family, uh, hard worker. He loved being a deacon. It's a second career, second vocation. He was a great man and much loved at uh, several churches here in Fort Collins. So we thought uh, maybe we'd have just a moment of silence for Thanksgiving for his life. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next year.